Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight on Cinema Showcase, it is my great pleasure to have as my guest a gentleman I have long admired and a gentleman who has given us some of our greatest films. Academy Award winner, Mr. Mervyn Leroy. His films are legendary. They include Little Caesar, I'm a Fugitive from the Chain Gang, Blossoms in the Dust, Random Harvest, Madame Curie, Quo Vadis, and many, many others. He has just written his autobiography, and it's entitled Mervyn Leroy, Take One. Tonight we'll be talking about the book and his great career. This evening, Mervyn Leroy on Cinema Showcase. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Cinema Showcase. We're here in the Hollywood offices of Mervyn Leroy, and it is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you for taking this time. Thank you, Jim. I'm very happy to be here. Your book, as I said in the introduction, is, um, well, you've just written it, and it's, it's marvelous, I must say. Well, I'm glad you liked it. It, 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 uh, it took a lot of, a lot of work and brought back a lot of memories, and Dick Kleiner, who wrote it with me, did a beautiful job. What made you decide to, um, to write the book now? Have you been thinking about it for a few years, or? Um... No, I'd been asked by Doubleday and a few, Doubleday and a few other companies for the last couple of years to write a book. And one day, this pal of mine, Dick Kleiner, walked in and said, Mervyn, I want to do your book. You know, he writes for about 500 newspapers. Mm -hmm. He's a very sweet man. He talked me into it. So Hawthorne Books took the book over, and they they printed it after we finished it. It, it is one of the most complete books I've ever read on films. In fact, it's, uh, I hate to bring up another book, but it, it reminded me in its great content of uh, Frank Capra's autobiography. Well, I think I th they're... Well, I think Frank Capra's book was the best book on well, motion picture. Well, let's say they're equal. But... Uh, I'd like to write it over. There's a lot of things in it that I left out, and maybe we could do it and take two. If oh, we could do that. Great. Once you started writing the book, did it um, was it easier than you thought, or did it prove a, a difficult undertaking? No, it was harder because it's so hard to remember back so many years. And then he went up and spoke to my cousins in San Francisco, and spoke to my children in New York, Lyndon Warner, and all my grandchildren trying to find out about me, and <laughs> and. Uh, that's that's how it works out, but I'm, I just hope that that you like it, Jim, and everybody likes it, and that it that it uh, that it's, it tells something about the motion picture business, which I think people should hear. Indeed, it does. Before we talk about some of your films, and as I told you before we started, there are many of them I want to talk about. Let me ask you uh, what led to your film career. You mentioned in the opening part of your book that you started out with two strikes against you. Would you explain that? Well, I did for this reason. You see, uh, I was in vaudeville with an actor called Roy and Cooper. And uh, originally I won the Charlie Chaplin contest in San Francisco as a kid at the World's Fair in 1915 Im imitating Chaplin <laughs> with about 800 other Contestants. I don't know how I won it, but I did win it. And then I went into vaudeville with a wonderful boy, Clyde Cooper, and we played all over under the name of Leroy and Cooper. We played the Orpheum Circuit, the Pantages Circuit, anything you can think of. And we were in New York playing, and my partner's father died, and he had to come home. And Jesse Lasky was my cousin. And I got in a few shows in New York, and I worked a little extra work in things at Fort Lee and motion pictures. One day I went to my cousin in New York, Jesse Lasky, and I told him I wanted to go to work in the motion picture business at the Lasky Studio here in Hollywood. So he tried to uh, to talk me out of it, but I wouldn't let him. And he said, all right, I'll give you a job in Hollywood, but don't mention my name, because it's very bad to have a relation in the studio. He said, it's no good for you and it's no good for me, so I agreed on that. So as I was walking out, I told him I was broke. I needed money to get back to California. He loaned me $150, which I paid him back, by the way. And I came out here, and I had this wonderful letter from him to, to give me a job out there. I guess I thought I was going to run the studio right <laughs> away. So they put me to work in the wardrobe department, folding wardrobe, 
on a movie called Secret Service with Robert Warwick. And uh, I used to go home at night dreaming of northern uniforms, southern uniforms, and <laughs> that's how I started. You make special point of mentioning in your book, uh, as you've just explained, really, that your road to Hollywood was accidental. And I think you say at one point that that most people, if they examine how they how they got somewhere, they will find that they owe a lot to fortune, to good luck, to um, to accidental things. Well, I think everything is timing, you know. As Jack Penny, the, who one of my dearest friends, is timing is his mm -hmm. great for it. I think that that the timing of me me coming out here was the right time, although it was tough. Yeah. I was in the wardrobe. I was in the lab dobbing film for night scenes and day scenes. You know, in those days, if you wanted a night scene, it, you uh, took the negative and dobbed it in a wash that made it blue. And if you wanted uh, uh, if you wanted sunlight, you dobbed it in a pink wash, which gave you a, well, a uh, daylight scene. Mm -hmm. And amber and... Uh, and uh, I go home at night with my right arm one <laughs> color, my left arm another color. And then I went to acting in a few pictures with Wallace Reed and Brian Washburn and Gloria Swanson. But I never wanted to act. I always wanted to direct. Yeah. You were an extra in the Ten Commandments, weren't you? I sure was. What were you, when you observed DeMille, it must have, did it come in handy years later when you directed a oh, yeah, great I, epic of mine that's called well, I used to watch him all the time. Yeah. In fact, you speak of them. Of the movie I made for a year in Rome, Quo Vadis. Yeah. Before I left Hollywood, I called up the master because they always called CB the master, and I said, Master, why did you make all these wonderful biblical pictures? And he said, Mervyn, why should I let two thousand years of publicity go to waste? <laughs> and that was his answer, and that was it. That that was it. And he was right too, believe me. Yeah. What were you able to observe about his handling of crowds? I mean, that's legendary, his his manipulation of crowds, getting the most out of... Well, well crowds are the easiest thing to work with. Hmm? Sure, because you... you uh, uh, when I was in Rome, I used 60,000 people for three weeks every day. But you see, it was handled this way. One man, one Italian man, is called a capo gruppo. And he has charge of 50 people. He takes care of them in the morning. He brings them in. He puts the jewelry on them, the wardrobe, the outfits, the uniforms. And he puts them in the stands, which is marked off A, B, C, and D, like you would do at a football game. So it's very easy. When you tell them to yell, they yell. And when you tell them to do this, the extras are very easy to work with. It's the principles sometimes <laughs> that are tough to work with. How did your, um, your first film as a director come about? Well, I was going to make a picture with with my dear friend Colleen Moore, who was responsible for me being a director. Colleen Moore and a man named Alfred E. Green, who was a fine director. Mm -hmm. but, and I was writing gags for her pictures. And they always wanted to call me a gag man. I said, no, I didn't like the name. I wanted to be known as a comedy constructor. So I was writing gags for, for Colleen Moore, and then I got to direct her first picture. There's a movie called When I Wish I Just Mind, taken from Peg in My Heart. Mm -hmm. And just before I was to, to, to start the movie, her husband, John McCormick, who was the head of the studio, he was fired. So they left, and I was out doing nothing. So she called one of the heads of First National in New York, Richard Rowland, and she asked him to please see that I got a picture. So I looked around for a story, and I found a story called No Place to Go, which fit, which fitted me perfectly, and I made that with, with Lloyd Hughes and Mary Astor. That was my first picture. Prior to, to going over to MGM in the late 30s, you made some of your greatest films at Warner Brothers. Do you recall your first meeting with Jack L. Warner? I certainly do. It was in San Francisco when he sang illustrated songs. Oh, really? Yeah, for Sid Grauman at the old Empress Theater in San Francisco. I've known Jack all my life. And your friendship has really endured all these, oh, yes, all these years? Oh, yes, yes. He's been very good to me. He's got a great sense of humor, and he was a great showman. Of course, he's full of a lot of corny jokes that everybody <laughs> talks, but he was a great showman. 
You directed, I know, um, your first... When did you make your first sound film? Was that 29, 30? I can't remember. Yeah. What was your reaction uh, to the, the new idea of sound? Did you have faith in Well, it? I love sound because I was in vaudeville. Mm -hmm. And I was an actor in vaudeville. I mean, I did a vaudeville act, and I loved sound, and I knew it was going to be great. I, uh, hundreds of people I talked to about here said, I yeah. forget it, but... Uh, I knew it was going to be great, the same as I think in time pay TV will be great for you and for me and for the cameraman and for everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the first of your great discoveries. You have discovered a number of people who went on to become some of our greatest stars, and I think the first mm -hmm. was in a film called Too Young to Marry. Uh, Already Young, young. That's How right. did that come about? Well, it was called Broken Dishes. It was a play. Mm -hmm by O.P. Hagee. It was a play in New York. And uh, I was given the property by Jack Warner, and I liked it. And I called up for her, her sister, Polly Ann Young, who was a beautiful girl and a good actress. And her mother said she's away on location, but what about my other daughter, Gretchen? So I said, who's Gretchen? She said, well, she's a very beautiful girl, and I think you should see her. So she brought her down, and and that was Loretta. I changed her name to Loretta, but her original name was Gretchen. She went on to become one of our greatest stars. Yes, and a, and a lovely lady with great taste, and yeah. she still is a star in my oh, life. Oh, yes, indeed. But no doubt I suppose Once you're, you're a star, you're always a star, and there are an awful lot of stars around mm -hmm. that, are, that are not working because they won't do a lot of the pictures that people want them to do. But there's no Spencer Tracy's around, there's no Gables around. Mm -hmm. Harry Grant's still around, but he's still a big star. Yeah. But uh, he doesn't want to do anything unless he feels it's absolutely great. None of us do. That's why uh, I know Greer Garson just did a, uh, a TV in London appearance. Uh, and I Crown think it's fine, yeah, that she only does things which, which perfectly suit her, because in my estimation, she is one of the greatest. And I'd like well, to talk about her in just a minute, too. Good. Clark Gable, though, is no doubt your greatest discovery, uh, in addition to Lana Turner and Loretta Young. Uh, the studio, though, didn't think that he was the, the great potential that you saw in him, did they? Well, he was playing downtown in Los Angeles in the last mile, mm -hmm. the part of Killer Mears. And I was sitting in the third, second or third row, and I looked up and I saw this guy with his arms <clears> on <throat> the bars in the convict clothes. I kept looking at him all through the show because he was the lead killer mayors. And after the show, I went backstage to see him. He had two or three agents. I didn't know who they were. And I asked him if he'd like to go in the movies. And he looked at me and he said, why? And I said, well, I'm going to make a picture called Little Caesar. And I'd like you to play the part of Joe Massara in Little Caesar. So he came out and he made a test and he made a fine test. But Mr. Zanuck and Mr. Warner said his ears were too big, so we never got Clark Gable. And I often said after that they would have liked to have him, to have, to have had him, just to release his ears. <laughs> but I made a couple of pictures with him afterwards, and uh, we were very good friends. And yeah. He was the king. He was called the king. He and Spencer Tracy and those kind of guys were the greats. Mm -hmm. Many of your films have, have made great contributions sociologically. They've made people think. But two things all of your films have is entertainment and taste. Do you that, think that's entertainment the is the... That comes number one. Yeah. And next comes good taste. And like I made a Little Caesar, it was a pretty tough gangster picture. They didn't even have the word, the word damn in it. Mm -hmm. Now some of these pictures, every other word is filthy. It's very easy to write a dirty, dirty story. Anybody can write a dirty story. What is the first thing you look for in a, a story you're considering to film? The writer. The writer? The writer is the most important thing in any part of show business. You have to have it on paper first. If you don't have it on paper, you can't do anything. I work with the writer, very close with the writer, but believe me, a writer is very important. Yeah. Or where do the ideas come from? It doesn't come from the writer. Okay. You have never... You have made all types of films, and you've never really been typecast as a director. Well, I've never made the same type of a motion picture uh, uh, twice. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you, you, you have the Lubitsch touch and this touch and that touch and the Hitchcock touch. My touch is a story, I guess, and I never want to make the same kind of a movie twice. Although there's really nothing wrong, I suppose, in a director like, like Hitchcock doing that type of film if he uh, enjoys that. I should say you, that. That's, uh, uh, Hitchcock is a great, great director. Yeah. He's done very well, and Lubitsch was a sensational Indeed. director, too, but they have their own way of doing them. Yeah. But, but a lot of their stories were on the same level and the same grade where, where mine are not, because I've never made the same type of a picture. Do you twice. consider uh, Little Caesar your first major success? Oh, yes. One thing about that film I've always liked was the way you developed the character of Rico, because in the beginning, we really don't like him. But I in the that. end... Uh, he felt sorry for him. Yeah, that, that well, magnificent he had a, closing line he had, that Edward G. Robinson had. Mother of Mercy is just the end of yeah, Rico. Yeah. yeah, but he was wonderful to work with. He was a great, great man. You have said that, in many ways, you consider uh, I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang to be your most important film. Why do you feel mm -hmm. that? Well, not my most important, but it was very important because that film took the chains off of the, of all the fugitives and convicts in Georgia, mm -hmm. off their legs and off their arms, and they were treated pretty brutally down there. Yeah. And we changed that, and that's why I was just proud of that. But uh, uh, people have said to me, you make message pictures. You know, it's your old story. If you want to send a message, go to Western <laughs> Union. But, but no, I don't make message pictures because I have no no idea what a message picture is, but I do have an idea of what real solid entertainment is. Mm -hmm. And that's all that counts after all. You know, there are so many powerful scenes in that film, I'm a Fugitive. The flogging scenes are still some of the most realistic and uh, vivid yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah, but I did most of that in the shadow, if you remember. Yeah, exactly. But they still have great impact. Well, sure, because the, well, the sound helps that a lot. You filmed uh, Tugboat Annie at MGM, and this was really before you went over to MGM, wasn't it? Uh, you did this in 32 or so. What yeah. was Marie Dressler like to work with? She, she was a darling, and she, and you know, at that time, she could only work, she could only work three hours a day because yeah. she, she was a very sick woman. She knew that she wasn't going to last long, and she could only work three hours a day, and that was her last picture, you know. Mm-hmm. And Wally Berry, he was quite a guy. And it was a great team. I love working with them, both of them. They made such a great team uh, on screen. Do they get along well off screen? Or I'm sure they had well, a Well, Wally wasn't screen. so easy to get along with off screen. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but uh, he was a fine actor and a big star, but uh, he was not as sweet as Marie Dressler. <laughs> Before we move over to MGM, I want to ask you about another of your your Waters films, and that's They Won't Forget. This is famous for a number of reasons, not the least of which, I imagine, is that it um, contains the debut of Lana Turner. That's right. How did you find her? How did I find her? Yeah. Well, a boy named Sally Biana, who worked for the Zeppo Marx agency here, he brought her in to me after I'd looked at maybe 50 or 60 girls, because, because I wanted a very sexy girl, beautiful, nice and clean looking, but sexy. Mm -hmm. And one day she walked in and that was it. So, in the scene as she walked down the street, as you remember, her her sweater shook a little and, and she became a sweater girl, but that was an accident too. Really? Yep, and we put the music to it, which, which <laughs> helped it a little, and, and that was quite a thing. In the late 30s, you did move over to Metro after doing They Won't Forget, and The Wizard of Oz you produced. Yes, I, pro I did produce The Wizard of Oz, which I'm very proud of. What are your fondest memories of The of, Wizard of, of Oz? Film, yeah. Well, I had a great director who worked for me, and that yeah. Victor Fleming. And you must remember that Victor Fleming did two pictures in that same year, or at least he started one in a year and a half. He did mm -hmm. Gone with the yes. Wind and The Wizard of Oz. He was a great director and uh, deserves a lot of credit. But I always wanted to make The Wizard of Oz since I was a little kid. So I finally think... got to make it. The fact that it has endured, as have so many of your films, but The Wizard of Oz in particular, for so many years, it's as fresh and beautiful. Uh, well, it was a beautiful story. Yeah. 
Let me ask you about Blossoms in the Dust. This, again, I keep using the, the, uh, the term beautiful, but it is a beautiful film. The Technicolor photography in that is some of the most ravishing I've seen. Well, it was a true story, too. You know, it was, was about Mrs. Gladney's mm -hmm. uh, home in, uh, in Texas. You babies, you know. Yeah. And that picture made an important uh, comment. Yes, it statement. did. Yes, it did, because Mrs. Gladney fought for those children down there and won everything she wanted mm. from the Senate. You have worked with um, Greg Arson in uh, four films, I believe, three or four films. Right. This is a large question, but how would you describe her to work with? Well, she has great heart. She has a great sense of humor. She's a fine actress, and I don't know how you can say any more than that. Yeah. She's, uh, she's, <clears throat> she's one of the greats. And as we said, she has, she has taste, which so many don't. All the great actors have taste, I think, yeah. because taste is born in cameramen, directors, yourself. Intuition mm -hmm. is the whole thing. You do everything from your heart. You don't do it from here. That's good. Random Harvest is another magnificent MGM Well, it was film. a great love story. It was a beautiful love story, and of <clears> course, <throat> had the greatest speaking voice of a man that was ever on the screen, Ronald Coleman. Of course, with Greer, you yes. had a pretty good team. <laughs> And they were wonderful to work with, and, uh, and Ronnie was a great man. And James Hilton particularly liked oh, your yes. film, didn't he? Oh, yes. <clears throat> he did the narration, you know, at the beginning yeah. of that film. That's his voice. MGM during this period was really the, um, the Tiffany of studios. How would, you, uh, how would you describe a typical day at MGM during this golden period? Well, a typical thing been... about MGM was Irving Thalberg, too, and L.B. Mayer. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, Irving Thalberg was one of the great geniuses of our business, was one of the great story minds, and they only wanted the best. Just to do the best, that's all they wanted. And Warner Brothers the same way, and Jack Warner and Sam Goldwyn and David Selznick and all of them. All of those men wanted nothing but the best. Mm -hmm. So many unfortunately derogatory things have been written about some of the moguls. Well, I listen, think it's a bit unfair. That's jealousy. Yeah. And I hate jealousy in anything. If a man makes a fine, fine movie, I'm, I'm one of the first to give him a big boost because it's tough to make them. Yeah. It's not easy to make a fine picture. I hold a record in the music hall. I've had 20 pictures in I the know. music hall. Yeah. I'm very proud of that. And I had a lot of, lot of help. I had, had a lot of men help me on these pictures. I had a great backfield. You can't do anything without a great backfield. Let's talk about a film um, you made in 1950, which to me, and I think to a lot of people, remains the, the epic of epics, and that is Quo Vadis. Um, this is one of the most awesome spectacles I think the screen has ever seen. Was it, it must have been something of a challenge for you. It was a Marshall challenge. and all of these people. It was a challenge for me because it was such a big picture and had so many people in it, so many sets, and well, I was in Rome with, with Sam Zibleth for 14 months doing this picture, so you know what it was. It was it wore me out. I lost 22 pounds making the picture, but uh, I was very happy about that. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I was happy about the movie because it wasn't epic, and epics are tough to make. Yeah. Because it's not the big scenes with the crowds of an epic, it's the small scenes with the intimate things. What's the story about? Mm -hmm. You know, you can have 8 million people in the background, but if you don't have something in the foreground, you have nothing. Yeah. Hmm. All of your films do have such a good visual sense. Is this a prerequisite for a director, a no. good director? Oh, yes. It's intuition, I think. I think that your, your camera setups, which I love because some of the boys are the shooting pictures now. They shoot under your arms, <laughs> through your nose, through your ear. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at all. It has to be a scene that holds. Every frame has to hold. Mm -hmm. How closely do you work with your um, photographer and art director in Very the Very closely. Very closely. Before the movie starts, I have a meeting with the cameraman, all the assistants, the, uh, the art directors, the writers. Everybody sits in, and we go over it so that it really works out to something. Mm -hmm. One thing also that I've admired in many of your films, and especially Quo Vadis, is the music. 
Miklos Rojas' music in that is magnificent. You bet it was. You bet it was. How, uh, how important to you is the dramatic score in your films? Very important in a picture like that. Mm -hmm. In a comedy, not so much, but in a heavy drama that really tells stories like Waterloo Bridge, it was very important to Waterloo Bridge with Vivian Lee and Robert Taylor. Mm -hmm. That was another pretty good-looking team. Indeed it was. You bet. It was a beautiful story. Of all of the, the great actors and actresses you have worked with, and I know this is an unfair question, you, you've already discussed Greer Garson. Are there other favorites that stand out to you that you've really enjoyed working with? Yes, they're all good or I wouldn't work with them. Really? Yeah. They're all great to me. I love to make great scenes and I work hard to make fine pictures. But you don't make fine pictures, as I said before, unless you have a great story and a mm. great backfield. Let's go back to um, a few years, really, to a film for which you won an Academy Award. That was a short film, The House I Live In. With Frank Sinatra. I made it in one day. Really? Tell me about that. Made it in one day. Well, it was a song, you know, that yeah. he was crazy about. And I was crazy about. Frank Ross was crazy about it. In fact, he found it. And we did it with these kids in one day. Oh, man. And won an Academy Award. I'm a nominated about five or six yeah. times at the Academy, but but I only won it on the, on the house I live in. I must ask you this question. Uh, again, it, it concerns Greer Garson, but she and Walter Pidgeon were one of the screen's greatest dramatic teams. Were they great friends? Uh, or oh, yeah. Are they off, off oh, camera yes. great friends? Yes, they were. They were very good friends. In fact, a pro is a pro no matter yeah. who it is. Yeah. It's the amateur, it's the guy who thinks he's a great actor that's not. The FBI story is a film which uh, I've seen several times and and love it. You had the full cooperation of the FBI on that, didn't and you? And Mr. Hoover, who was one of the greatest men that ever lived, I think. Really? Yeah. You bet. And the FBI is, is a great institution, which he made. And even he has come under uh, attack in recent years. Sure, which... because he knew too much. I think that if the J, J. Edgar Hoover were living today, all this thing that's going on around the world wouldn't happen. Not you around the world, right. I mean the United States. Yeah, you may be right. We are regrettably running out of time. I wanted to talk about Gypsy, which is a musical I love, moment to moment, which I enjoy. What are your, uh, what are your future plans? I hope you're going to make another film soon. Well, I'm getting two stories ready, a big western called Cowboys and Indians, and James Serber's the 13 Clocks, which I hope to be another Wizard of Oz. Great, great. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that. I hope you'll get Miklos Roja to do the music for one of them. Well, I'd like to <laughs> because he's one of the best. And I want to yeah. thank you because this has been a very interesting interview for well, me. Well, it's been uh, unforgettable for me, and I want to invite you to Atlanta. Well, I'd love Please to come, come down us. there. Sure, I want to see Hank Aaron here another whole month. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank it's you very much, Jim. My thanks to all of you for watching tonight, and be with me again next time. Good evening.